Well, welcome to the, to the, the Monday edition of groundbreaking studies in CALS. Uh, our speaker today is one of those who actually knows what he's talking about because he, he, the whole subject was, uh, was his creation. Barney uh, Easterday is, was the dean of the School of Veterinary Medicine and before that uh, he was assigned the job of, of creating the School of Veterinary Medicine, uh, which he did and was its first dean. He told me that one of the previous times he lectured to this class, a student came and asked him if, if he was the uh, Easter Day Drive, and the answer is yes. There's a street here named after him. Any, anybody else know of one? I don't. Anyway, it's pardon me, Easter Day, it's a pleasure to have you. So thank you, Dave, and good afternoon, everybody. And I use the term good, yeah. <clears throat> sort of like you're supposed to, but it's not really very good out there. I guess it's going to get worse. So anyway, <clears throat> um, thank you very much for this invitation. And uh, the 107 plus years uh, will become, the, the plus will become more evident as we go along. But it, I, I just want to make sure you knew that it uh, has nothing to do with my age. So, uh, <clears throat> so to, to get started, to put this in perspective a little bit where we are and give some dates of uh, when the university was established, uh, officially established in 1848, but the first class in 1849. In 1883, the Ag Experiment Station came on board and then in 1889, the College of Agriculture. <clears throat> so 1911, that's 107 years ago. That's where the 107 comes from. But there, we're gonna go back before then, and I'm never, never sure how many years that is, and so I just use plus. So put it in perspective, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, what we're talking about is the Department of Veterinary Science was established in 1911, and the School of Veterinary Medicine was established in 1979, and the first class of veterinary medical students was admitted in 1983. <clears throat> so in, 19, in 1868, going back through the archives, the, the university catalog does list instruction in veterinary medicine and surgery. And I never was able to figure out exactly what that is in any sort of detail. And then <clears throat> there is record that the first veterinarian uh, was appointed on the campus, uh, Dr. Vickers Atkinson, who was serving as the state veterinarian. That would have been in the, at that time, State Department of Agriculture. And that the, a, a short course uh, concerning veterinary medicine was established at that time. <clears throat> During a period of 1896 to 1901, there was a section within the, within the Department of Animal Husbandry uh, where there was instruction in veterinary science. And again, exactly what was that veterinary science was not clear, but I think we have a little bit of idea some of the examples of the courses that were listed were like anatomy and physiology of horses, cattle, sheep, swine, and poultry, uh, animal hygiene, obstetrics, farm medicine, whatever farm medicine is, and then because horses were a big thing back at that time, shoeing and unsoundness, unsoundness being horses that were lame. So the <clears throat> Department of Veterinary Science was actually established in 1911 with two uh, faculty members, a Dr. F Fred Hadley, who was the chair and prof of the department, and Dr. Alexander Alexander, a prof, who came from the Department uh, of Animal Husbandry. And he had been there in animal husbandry in some time. And the department was then first located 
in the stock pavilion at that time in a couple of, of offices there. This is Dr. Hadley, who was a bacteriologist uh, doing some work at a desk. And this is Dr. Alexander, <clears throat> who had immigrated from Scotland and was a, a, a very special equine specialist known particularly throughout the Midwest here uh, <clears throat> after he got established in the animal husbandry department. And then a year after the department was <clears throat> established, uh, Dr. Beach came on board. And I, it was my pleasure to have known uh, Dr. Beach because uh, we, I overlapped with him before he retired when I was a graduate student, not quite 107 years ago, but a while ago. But I, and I, <clears throat> so there was the location of the Department of Veterinary Science uh, where it first was, uh, and then it was in one of the buildings along Henry Mall here for a short time, and then it was in the Hiram Smith Annex. Uh, you know, this this building here, uh, Ag Hall would be up here, Microbial Sciences over there, uh, <clears throat> and so that was where the Department of Veterinary Science was when I came on board as a graduate student in 1956. Um, when they outgrew that, <clears throat> the, this building was built in 1964, still stands across the street from the stock pavilion. I think it's ironic that where the department first, <clears throat> where first lived was in the stock pavilion and then later on this would be built in uh, 1964, now known as the Robert P. Hansen a biomedical sciences building. And I thought it might be interesting for you to see the fantastic salaries these people got at that time. Uh, the chair of the department with $2,240, Dr. Alexander, because he had been around longer. And then Dr. Beach started out in 1912 at $1,400, and in 1950 got all the way up to $6,400. <clears throat> and uh, to put it in perspective, so what, what some of the others were at that time, the, the president, uh, Van Heys, was all the way up at 7th Howe, and uh, the <clears throat> dean of agriculture at 5th Howe. I don't know what Cal's budget is now, but you know, look at U UW budget <clears throat> back then, and the UW system budget now is uh, something uh, more than $5 billion. So, Times have changed a little bit. So in, in, in 1912, in the Department of Veterinary Science, uh, these were the courses that were listed as Introduction to Veterinary Science, Common Disease of Livestock, Veterinary Hygiene, Advanced Veterinary Anatomy, and then Thesis for Graduate Study. Uh, the Veterinary Hygiene course went on for many, many years and we were still teaching that in the department in the late 60s and early 70s. But at that time, it was known as the Prevention and Control of Diseases of Livestock and Poultry. And it was particularly designed for animal science students. So the, when that department was formed, <clears throat> um, there were sort of four main diseases that were a problem in Wisconsin that, at that time in the livestock industry. Uh, one being bovine tuberculosis, and then bovine brucellosis, or contagious abortion, also undulate fever in the human being. What we know now as classical swine fever, or known then as hog cholera, and Yoni's disease. So uh, bovine tuberculosis was an interesting one because Professor Russell, had studied in Europe and knew about <clears throat> the, the tuberculin. And when he came back, he had tuberculin, and he tested some of the cattle in the Ag Experiment Station and showed that 25 of the 28 cows that he tested were infected with tuberculosis. Well, <clears throat> there were a lot of doubters that 
if you injected this, put this little stuff under the skin and it swelled up, that it meant it, they had tuberculosis. And so they did <clears throat> uh, demonstrations where they did injections of the cattle with the tuberculin. And then with the, when they had the positive ones, for the doubters that say, well, this cow is okay, it's just got this little swelling where they injected that stuff. Then, like in the stock pavilion, they had um, cattle that were positive in the tuberculin test that they did necropsies on to demonstrate that they had the lesions of the disease. <coughs> and for the doubters, they even went out into the field where they had tested cattle, and then the cattle were, that were positive were killed, and they were able to demonstrate to the people, look, these animals really are infected, that here are the lesions. <coughs> So brucellosis, <coughs> uh, contagious abortion, Bang's disease, or in the human, human being, undulate fever. Uh, widespread uh, disease of cattle. And so they, at, during this early time, they, brucellosis control was developed where they would test animals, and if they were positive, then they were culled. And then starting in 1936, they had calf hood vaccination, which was called strain 19, which was a live brucella organism that they vaccinated these uh, animals with. So here is Dr. Birch, uh, Dr. Beach actually uh, collecting serum to test it to see whether the animal is positive for brucellosis. And here is Dr. Birch, uh, one of our extension veterinarians many years later, vaccinating a calf with strain 19. And <clears throat> notice the date here, 1923, that uh, there was a short course uh, for uh, veterinarians to come in and to learn how to do this agglutination test for the presence to see whether these animals were positive for brucellosis. And uh, it, it's interesting to note the dress there of the people with their ties and coats and doing their, their short course, learning how to do agglutination tests. Then, <clears throat> right after WW2 in 1945, there was a <clears throat> move to expand the research and study of brucellosis in the Department of Veterinary Science in the College of Agriculture. And Charmony Farm was purchased at that time. Now, <clears throat> Charmony Farm now looks a little different than this. Uh, you know, um, this is Mineral Point Road. That's the belt line back there. And guess what? There aren't any fields there anymore. But uh, <clears throat> it, was, it was purchased that, at that time uh, to, to have space uh, with the barns, et cetera, and, and built a little later an isolation facility so they could do the infectious disease work here. So this is in the mid to late 40s. <clears throat> and I'd point out that this is Rose Road here, so if you know where you are, you know, Whitney Way would be back down this way a little ways. So uh, <clears throat> in the very early 50s, then, this barn was added, and it was, it was, uh, was added sort of right in here. And this barn came from the uh, West Hill Farms, uh, you know, just west of where Hilldale is now, because that was all farmland. And that barn was there as part of the uh, Cal's operation. And uh, <clears throat> it, it was actually moved out there to be, again, to expand the brucellosis program. And uh, <clears throat> speaking of Hilldale, I don't, you know, at the corner of what would be Midvale and University, that whole area there, I can remember where, when there were cattle and, and pig pens in that area. So, so <clears throat> the department, UW and the department were very <clears throat> uh, active in the brucellosis program. 
and they, they developed a selective medium, which was called medium W, uh, a selective medium for growing the brucella organism. And <clears throat> Dr. Branley, who was uh, chairman of the department, this is in 1954, Dr. Branley here, uh, was, uh, went to a meeting in Europe and took that, <clears throat> that medium with him and it was uh, within the formula, et cetera, and it became worldwide use for the, the selective growth and detection of the brucella organism. And another member of the uh, department, Dr. McNutt, was a very <coughs> active person in the fight against brucellosis. And this is, so when it says he ends his fight, this is telling about his, his uh, retirement. But he was uh, an early on member of the Department of Veterinary Science, working particularly with brucellosis as well as hog cholera. And forget the one on the right, but this is Dr. Berman, Dr. David Berman, who sort of <clears throat> was a partner with Dr. McNutt and picked up and was very, very active in the Brucella program and also became very much uh, involved with the World Health Organization with bovine brucellosis sort of in many places in the world. So classical swine fever, <clears throat> as it's known now, and hog cholera, as we knew it then, started in 1833, was first identified in 1883 in southern Ohio and Indiana, and then it, it spread just sort of throughout the country in a relatively short time. And it was in 1906 that there was developed a vaccination system called serum and virus. And it was <clears throat> a process where the pigs were inoculated with the virulent hog cholera virus and then inoc simultaneously with hyperimmune serum. So the pigs were protected while the virus grew and developed an active antibody. So it was in 1978 that the USDA was, the USA was declared free of hog cholera. And before that happened, the, the serum and virus vaccination had to go away. And so that was, it was because you, you couldn't expect to abolish a disease if you're using virulent virus out there to, as part of the vaccination program. So that, uh, and this was the, the process of inoculating uh, the virus and then the, the amount of hyperimmune serum that you injected depended upon the weight of the pig so that you provided the protection to the pig. And there, <clears throat> Uh, on the west, west part of the campus, and you see the pigs there in those buildings. Those are buildings that were behind the Biotron, where the Biotron is now. And that was a major hyperimmune serum production area uh, for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And so, <clears throat> uh, big time hog collar work here on the campus. And Dr. Beach, one of those early, the third member of the Department of Veterinary Science was very much active in the development of the hog collar control system. And then the third disease, Yoni's disease, or bovine paratuberculosis. And in searching some of the records, I found uh, a couple of papers uh, in 1915 16 by Prof Professor Beach, Hadley, and Hastings in bacteriology. And I went to Dr. Collins, who's working with Yoni's disease now, and I said, hey, Mike, look at this. And he looked at the titles and he said, hmm, nothing's changed. Mm -hmm. And so on Thursday, you'll hear from Dr. Collins to find out if anything has actually changed. So after <clears throat> talking about those uh, particular the four specific diseases, the department was then very much involved with uh, uh, turkey and chicken diseases, and particularly turkeys because of the big turkey was industry in northwestern Wisconsin. Uh, 
later on <clears throat> in the mid 50s began very much involved with arthropod borne, mosquito borne diseases, and, uh, and now uh, in, in, in with the mosquitoes, and so there was an interaction with the entomology department. And now recently there was established the uh, Midwestern, Midwestern, Midwestern Center for uh, vector borne diseases. Uh, and also now a combination, a cooperation between veterinary medicine and entomology. And then also in the mid 50s began to be, uh, the department began to be involved with, uh, with wildlife, uh, with deer and other things. And uh, that wildlife disease still goes on. And some of the wildlife diseases that uh, <clears throat> were uh, talked about, uh, yeah, you hear, hear about it now, CWD, uh, chronic wasting disease. Well, since this is 2018, uh, I couldn't help, but I couldn't ignore 1918, which was the, the worldwide pan pandemic of what was called the Spanish flu that went throughout the world and uh, killed millions and millions of people. And so in the last month or so, you've been hearing about uh, uh, influence in this country. but. <clears throat> there, I had it. Just couldn't couldn't uh, resist saying something about influenza. In 1949, there was a swine influenza virus isolated on the East East Hill farm, and <clears throat> so I thought that's interesting. So I wonder how much swine influenza work was done before that, because. 1918 had appeared in human beings, and it also appeared in swine at that time. And so I've finally <clears throat> found a gold mine in some of the old records that lists all of the publications from the Department of Veterinary Science from uh, 1910 until 1952. And there is not one paper there about swine influenza which I find it very fascinating because it, it had to have been a problem uh, because we know that in Iowa and Illinois that it was a big problem. And so <clears throat> in the 1960s, we began working with swine influenza here and uh, it was also dur <clears throat> during that time that the avian influenza uh, began to be a problem. and. Uh, it was a big problem in the turkey populations in north uh, western Wisconsin. And so uh, <clears throat> Wisconsin did a, a major sort of contribution to understanding uh, uh, animal influenzas. And then from the 1980s onward, a lot of work on influenza as a zoonotic disease, as an animal and human disease. And now, um, very much uh, fascinating work at the Influenza Research Institute on the campus uh, uh, directed by Dr. Kawaoka. Um, yours truly, yours truly is the one on the right, uh, uh, <coughs> did a fair amount of work with, uh, with swine influenza and uh, with uh, a practitioner colleague in Broadhead who kept saying to me, you know, I think, you know, I see a lot of swine flu, and I think people become infected. And so I said, well, when it happens, why don't you let me know, and we'll take samples and so forth. And so <clears throat> after six or eight years, I got a call one morning, and he said, yeah, I've got sick pigs and a sick farmer, and uh, could I come and take the samples? And I did, and uh, sure enough, with we managed to get the virus from both the pigs and the farmer. And that was, uh, well, there had been serological evidence that people were infected who had been in contact with pigs. Uh, this was the, the conclusive evidence that it did, in fact, transfer from pigs to human beings. <clears throat> and along about the same time, with the, the appearance of the uh, influenza virus in 
turkeys particularly, and then later on in chickens in this country, there was concern about where does it come from? And the, the began to focus on migratory waterfowl. And uh, so <clears throat> with our wildlife ecology colleagues, et cetera, uh, we began sampling ducks during the hunting season along the Mississippi River and were able to find influenza viruses in those. And then we had a connection um, with people in Alaska and got to go to the Pribilof Islands and sample seabirds, uh, this being a mirror here, and uh, netting them off of the cliffs, you know, it's only 100 feet above the water, and there is a rope there. Oh. And, and, <laughs> and uh, sure enough, we, along with a lot of other people around the world, began to find these influenzas in migratory waterfowl and, and seabirds. So another big, big thing came along <clears throat> in the Department of Veterinary Science, Scrapie, a disease of sheep, transmissible mink encephalopathy, <clears throat> and the BSE, or bovine spongiform encephalopathy, and the CWD that you hear about a lot now. So the pre prion diseases, uh, uh, that began, that worked in the late 60s. Oh, in addition to infectious disease stuff, uh, the Department of Veterinary Science then uh, was involved in various aspects of physiology, digestive physiology, cardiopulmonary, reproductive, and then in parasitology with both protozoan and metazoan parasites and both internal and external parasites. And this sort of work still goes on. So I thought it was interesting, it's in a way kind of boring to look at this, but you see here it's the Wisconsin Veterinary Medical Association at a short, short course for veterinarians, 1923. And so the department, as a part of CALS and other parts of CALS, were doing these kinds of, of short courses for various groups. And here's a group of veterinarians, and notice particularly the dress there. And then uh, another short course for veterinarians, again in 1926. Uh, a poultry disease short course in 1954, and uh, the old timer, uh, Dr. Beach, is right here. And there's <clears throat> there's something else for 1954, something else very unique about that photo. I wonder if anybody sees it. Hawaiian shirt. What? Hawaiian shirt. Hawaiian shirt. There's a girl. What? One female, one female. So this, <clears throat> back then, you know, <clears throat> that was, you know, females in veterinary medicine were very unusual, and it's now a very different with about 75 to 80% of our veterinary medical classes are now female. And again, part, part of that poultry disease short course, uh, this, is, this is Dr. Hansen, doing some dissection of uh, chickens. And then a, uh, a, re a bovine reproductive disease short course, and uh, you know how many people are there getting their arm warm and uh, you know, doing pregnancy exams in, in the cattle here. So there are a lot of, a lot of these kinds of continuing education courses that went on over, over the years. And, uh, most of the ones I've showed are ones mainly uh, uh, in which VetSci was, was, was uh, part, uh, participated here, uh, mastitis, the uh, disease of cattle, here in a nutrition conference, 1964, so forth. And then I just <clears throat> wanted to stick in here, the, these were the, the seven last chairs of the Department of Veterinary Science. Uh, Dr. Carl Olson, Dr. Dave Berman, Dr. Robert Hansen, Dr. Tom Ewell, Dr. Jim Will, Dr. Dick Marsh, and yours truly. And uh, so we, that group of seven spanned from the mid-50s uh, to the mid-80s. Well, a new, <coughs> a new dimension sort of 
appeared on the campus in the early 1930s. Uh, and uh, the Secretary of Agriculture, then known as Director of Agriculture at the State Department of Agriculture, contacted the, the Dean of Agriculture saying it, it was time to develop a animal diagnostic uh, laboratory so that there could be uh, a service for veterinarians and producers throughout the state to help identify a, <clears throat> a disease in, in livestock. And so they had an agreement and the first uh, diagnostic lab activities were in two, <clears throat> two uh, rooms in Ag Hall. Later on, it was in this building, which still stands, it's behind the Biotron, and this building was built in 1938. <clears throat> and then it sort of outgrew itself by 1964, and there was another lab built on Mineral Point Road as a part of Charmony Farm. And then uh, in 05, this building, the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, now next door to the School of Veterinary Medicine was built. So that, it was originally a part of the Department of Agriculture. It is now a part of the university and there's a, a great interaction between the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab and the School of Veterinary Medicine. So School of Veterinary Medicine. April 1947, the Board of Regents resolved that there should be a School of Veterinary Medicine when funds were adequate. So it was only 481 months later that the first Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degrees were awarded in May of 1987. So think about it. 1947, there should be a School of Veterinary Medicine. Well, <clears throat> in the early to mid-1950s, there were bills introduced in the legislature to establish a School of Veterinary Medicine, and they didn't happen. In the mid-1960s, with the, the fantastic support of Dean Pound, the College of Agriculture, there was a, another push for a School of Veterinary Medicine. And then in the late 60s, uh, River Falls and Madison put forward proposals to establish a School of Veterinary Medicine. Well, at that time, there were two university systems, the Wisconsin State University and University of Wisconsin. So River Falls in Wisconsin State and Madison in UW. And then the CCHE, or Coordinating Council on Higher Education, was there to sort of resolve and, and uh, <coughs> uh, issues and sort of make things work together between the two uh, systems. And so when these two things appeared uh, at the <coughs> two proposals for a school by River Falls and Madison, and went to the Coordinating Council on Higher Education, and in their great wisdom, they decided there was no overwhelming need for a School of Veterinary Medicine in Wisconsin. So then, in 1971, a merger came about, where the two systems were merged into one. And so there, in the mid-1970s, there were two bills that passed in the legislature, and they were vetoed by Governor Lucy. Well, there was very, very strong support for the School of Veterinary Medicine from the ag community, and with particular activity with the Wisconsin Farm Bureau. So this was in actually 1975 and 76 when those bills were passed and then vetoed. And then in July of 77, Governor Lucy was appointed ambassador to Mexico, and Lieutenant Governor Schreiber became acting governor. Well, when the, when the school was first established, I was very often asked, is, is there any one person who's responsible for a school, your School of Veterinary Medicine? Yes, indeed, there is one person responsible. That's President Jimmy Carter, because he appointed Governor Lucy to Ambassador to Mexico, and that removed the obstruction to a School of Veterinary Medicine in Wisconsin. So, so then acting Governor Shriver began to get to work right away. He was very supportive of, of a, a school and sent a, um, the, the governor legislator sent a directive to the Board of Regents 
to do a study on what a school of veterinary medicine would be and with various sorts of options and uh, report it by December of 78 and then that would be for the the legislature to to consider whether or not they would do a school and so <clears throat> it was then in July of 79 that Dr. Uh, that Governor Dreyfus signed the bill that established the School of Veterinary Medicine and in <clears throat> July of 79 and it was to admit the first class by the fall of 1983. So gee whiz, you only got four years to plan, develop, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, and build a school. So <clears throat> um, I got called to uh, uh, Chancellor Shane's office one day, and he said, um, "Yeah, we've got word." From the words come down from the Board of Regents, there's a study, da 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 do, and we have to do this, da 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 And <clears throat> I need somebody to lead the charge, and you can't say no. Oh, okay. And so the five of us here were the, the core team with a whole bunch of other people helping to, that, to develop the, the plans for the development of the school. This was... Uh, Dr. Bristol, who was an extension veterinarian, a clinician, uh, Dr. Redmond, that we stole from the medical school as our money person, uh, Linda Chancellor, who was a secretary, uh, Dr. Highland, uh, who had just finished a PhD, and she had indicated at one time she was interested in experience in higher education administration, and so she came on board too. And then, as I say, we had Lots of others from River Falls, from Platteville, et cetera. And from campus, you know, we're Peter Bunn, who was secretary of the uh, faculty, uh, was the chancellor's representative. And then Al Beaver, who had been a faculty member at River Falls and was assistant vice president, who was the representative for UW System at that time. And so the, the seven of us were the core, and then we had countless people who helped in the whole process. Um, <clears throat> sadly, uh, I just have a, sadly, Peter, who had been you know, a real key member, uh, died in an airplane crash five days after the school was dedicated. So on an early April day in 1981, this was the groundbreaking ceremony. And uh, you can see that's a wharf building over there. So you <clears throat> get some idea of where we are and it's behind where the School of Veterinary Medicine is now. So at the groundbreaking ceremony, we had uh, two very key legislators, Dr. Ger uh, Assemblyman Jervis Hefner and uh, Senator Tom Harnish. And they had been the leaders in the legislature to make this happen. And then Ms. Grignano uh, was representing the, the construction company, and then Dr. Hyland, who you had seen before. So this was in April <clears throat> of, <clears throat> of uh, 81, and the, the plan was to, we had to admit the class by July, uh, August of 83, so we had just a little over two years, and they actually finished ahead of schedule. And when the, once the building got going, uh, Dr. Highland was our sort of construction coordinator, and she came back one day and she said, you know, I got evidence that there's a real need for a school of veterinary medicine because we keep seeing this cat that's looking for some veterinary medical care. And so this cat became a resident of the, of the building that was being built. So there it was as it was built, and we moved into that in March of 1983. And guess who our first client was? Bucky. And with him here, Dr. Dr. Gorling, who was our first chair of, of, of surgical sciences and now associate dean for research and graduate training. So a dedication took place early in June of 1983 in front of the, the school um, with a variety of speakers. Uh, Dr. Shane, uh, uh, Chancellor Shane, uh, you're speaking. <coughs> And we were also 
delighted to have Governor Dreyfus be a part of the, <coughs> uh, the dedication ceremony. So then the first class graduated in May of 1987. And the last one of the graduates across, the last one of the graduates across the platform had arranged to do this <clears throat> to be the last one. It said, it's only appropriate that I be the last one because of my name. His name was Zuba, Z-U-B-A. And so, and you could see that he arranged on his, <clears throat> his mortarboard, there are a group of animals. And you can't really tell from this, but most of them are exotics. And when he left, uh, <clears throat> after he graduated, he went to San Diego Zoo, is still there as one of the lead veterinarians at San Diego Zoo. So it was, uh, you can, can, can see the, the smiles on the people here with, with Jeff with his team. So last May was the 30th anniversary of the graduation of the first class of Doctors of Veterinary Medicine. And that has its foundation in the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences because the Department of Veterinary, Veterinary Science was such a strong component, the, the research and graduating component, that uh, most schools of veterinary medicine have not had when they, uh, when they started out. And that, that has been the, the real sort of plus that we've had along the way. There are now, uh, I'm not sure about, uh, I think about 2,600 uh, grads, DVM grads. Do, do any of you guys know what? No. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's about about uh, about that many grads so far. And then uh, before that, there would have been uh, a few hundred uh, masters and PhDs from the Department of Veterinary Science. And so, spanning the globe, you'll find our masters and PhD grads, our DVM grads, pretty much spanning the globe. So with that, I stop, and I'd be glad to entertain any questions. Thank you. All these people who showed up for the DVM short course, all the people who came to the DVM short course in the 20s, 30s, later, where were they trained? Okay. <clears throat> They, uh, back when the sort of the probably four schools of veterinary medicine, um, Iowa State would have been the oldest one in the area, uh, Michigan State, Kansas State, and Ohio State. So those four schools would have been the main place for uh, DVMs. But also <clears throat> at the turn of the century, uh, the previous, not the one we're in now, but in 1900, there were several private schools of veterinary medicine in the country. Yeah, like there was one in Chicago, Grand Rapids, I don't know, the, the, there were many of those that disappeared when the universities began to establish schools. Uh, University of Pennsylvania is the oldest school of veterinary medicine in the country, and there are now 30 accredited schools of veterinary medicine in the United States. And so if you <clears throat> would, would go back sort of like to my era, uh, the grads, the practitioners you would have seen would have been Iowa State, Michigan State, Ohio State, Kansas would have, those four would have been the main main ones. I have two questions. That house at the Rosie Road and Mineral Point Road is still there. Do you know what's going to happen to it? And the second question is, is there any relationship between human tuberculosis and, what is it, cow tuberculosis? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> there are two different, two different organisms, but, yeah, they go back and forth. Yeah. The house, uh, it is so sad to drive by there and see that house deteriorating, as it is. It is... Uh, it was, it was a beautiful house, and I, I don't know of any plans for it other than it to fall apart, <laughs> sadly, yeah. 
Um, the other question was: there any relationship between human tuberculosis and uh, what is it, cow bovine tuberculosis? Yeah. They're, they are the same. Well, no. I'm going to ask Mike to to to, to explain that on Thursday because he's 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 going to be talking about Yonis disease and paratuberculosis. So I'd ask Mike to to do to do that then and and sort of what's going on now. But the short answer is yes. They're fundamentally the same disease, yeah. and they go back and forth. Yeah. So, yes? Uh, some of these overlaps now between human disease and animal disease, I can see a research organization like the NIH wanting to support that kind of stuff. But does the NIH support uh, work in this area now? Uh, and historically, was it pretty much, where, where would the outside support for research come from? Where would, where would what have come from? Research support come from. All USDA, historically? Uh, oh, no, NIH. Big time, yeah, big time research, yeah. And particularly with, you know, you go back, you know, with anything as a zoonotic disease, it, you would have find, found big time support from uh, NIH and also uh, NSF, so, yeah. And the, the one now that I mentioned, the Midwestern Center for Excellence in Vector-Borne Disease. Uh, I, I think, Chuck, I'm right, that's funded from CDC, isn't it? That's, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. But to kind of jump in, in this day, there are people, in the, well, quite a few people in the school with funding from the NIH, which have to justify as a model for human disease for the most part. There's a few exceptions to that. And there has been a fair amount of USDA funding over the years as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. What, Mike? Well, this is a lead-in for Thursday. Barney mentioned that there were four diseases when they started out in 1920s. Three of those are eradicated from Wisconsin for sure and mostly the United yes, States. It's... One remains. I'll talk about that Thursday. Yeah. Oh. Chuck? Well, I noticed there's some students in the audience. I was a grad student here in the 70s, and I used to park my car on a gravel lot, which is basically where the School of Veterinary Medicine is now. So you just don't know what's going to develop. And you walk, it's like walking down a country lane until you got to the old dairy lab. So things have changed on campus, and if you come back in the future, you'll undoubtedly see changes as well. Well, look at where, where the school is now, I can remember riding horseback in there doing barrel bending because that was a big pasture area. So, <laughs> yeah, it had a couple of things have changed. It. Yeah, 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 so. Thanks, Barry. My pleasure.